text. So Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 is what the lesson actually covered, and it, it's about uh, immorality and some warnings about that. And specifically, um, we have some discussion in chapter 6 about uh, financial imprudence and also about just laziness, and there may be even some connection we can make with there. And then uh, what is described as a worthless person, a wicked man, and I believe, as we'll talk about, uh, verses 12 through 19 form a, a unit, not just in a broad sense of, you know, like this is a category with a bunch of different topics, but it's talking about a person that looks like all of these things. And we can, we can and will for a moment, the book encourages us to do so, break down some of those specific sins, the six things the Lord hates, seven are abomination to him, and, and really talk about what those are and what they look like and, and all, but here's a person who exhibiting all of these. And that might be hard to believe, but I think it's more common than we probably would originally think. But then chapter 6 picks up with verse 20 on that sexual immorality um, topic again, and that runs through the entirety of chapter 7. So I'm actually going to do a, a thing here, and we are going to skip the first part of chapter 6 and pick up with the immorality so it'll be more seamless and then we'll, we'll jump back there in chapter 6. So the, the primary discussion of this section of scripture has to do with sexual immorality and we covered almost all of chapter 5, the last three verses I think we neglected to get to, but those are essentially saying that God knows your path and where it actually leads. The, there's a way that seems right to a man, but it's in is the way of death. The ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord. He ponders all his paths, verse 22. His own iniquities entrap the wicked man, and he's caught in the cords of his sin. Look, your lust, what you're wanting, is actually going to be the cause for your downfall. It's not going to be anybody's fault but your own. God is telling you where this path leads. And then he says, he shall die for lack of instruction, and in the greatness of his fall he shall, he shall go astray. So that's really the whole context of Proverbs, is here is a wise one... Obviously, the Spirit, um, God is telling us this, but here's a father telling his son how things actually are. Listen to me. I know better than you. And uh, I'm sure that you as parents have said that more times than you would care to admit or more times than you can count. Um, I, I know better than you. I'm smarter than you. Just listen to me. And I'm sure that I'll say that plenty as well. And so I think this resonates with us. But here's the thing. God's our Father, and He's trying to tell us the same thing. Um, listen to us. Uh, listen to um, the instruction that I'm giving you, um, and you'll be you'll be saved by it. You'll you'll avoid um, a terrible end. So chapter five is a warning in verses one through six about the well. It's an encouragement to pr retain and preserve wisdom. You don't just gain it, but when you reach a point in your life where there is an occasion of temptation of conflict. You've got to guard that wisdom and not listen to the wisdom of others. Not walk with the ungodly, as Psalm 1 and verse 1 says, in, in the counsel of the ungodly. So preserve it because, listen, this immoral woman's going to sound really good. Her lips strip with honey, and uh, it says that her mouth is smoother than oil. And here's where chapter 7 really comes in. Chapter 7 is a, an, an account, an illustration of what we've studied in chapter 5. And so here's what it is. Here's how dangerous it is. I've seen it, is what the father's telling the son. I'll tell you of a time where I saw a foolish youth do this and chomped at the bait and lost um, his life for it uh, as he knows it. Chapter 5 and verses 7 through 14 really talked about some of those consequences and uh, we looked at that a lot. I think, I think and, and we spent a lot of time on this, and so we're not going to rehash it necessarily, but verses 15 through 20 of Proverbs 5 is, I think, the key that unlocks sexual purity, especially for our youth. Um, it's not avoiding the topic. It's not acting like it's a bad thing. But it's putting it in its proper context that God created it to be in. And so when he talks about drinking water from your own cistern, what's he talking about? And from your own wells. What's that imagery of? Or symbolic for? Loving your own water. Yeah, loving your own water. You're, 
your, it's your own. It doesn't belong to someone else. It does indeed belong to you and the sexual satisfaction in that relationship. It's like quenching thirst. We know how strong that urge is that we've been created with. And he's saying the only place that you can properly quench that thirst is marriage. And then he talks about how you have that ability. You were created with the ability uh, as the opposite sex to give that satisfaction to another. Now you are the source. It's your streams. It's your, it's your water. Don't let it run everywhere, but only with the one that you actually belong to and has a right to you. That's what that next section, I believe, is teaching verses 16 through 18 and he says let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth so this this uh, this uh, seductive immoral woman is going to try to use you that's what's happening usually we think of it kind of in, in the opposite way especially if you have daughters you know they only have one thing on their mind they're using you but here it's telling this, this young man, devoid of understanding, listen, it seems really charming and alluring, but she's just using you. Your fountain won't be blessed with her. It's only to satisfy your wife. And so rejoice with the wife of your youth. And so I think if we get that across to ourselves and to our children, we talk about it, we, we talk about it in the healthy way that the scripture portrays it, um, I know it's an intimate and it's a, a somewhat embarrassing subject at times, but that's what leads to the neglect, which leads to the perversion. So if we talk about it and we give its proper context there, not only will we avoid sexual immorality, but our marriages will be better and uh, will be blessed in that. So, so we've got all that. Um, God knows where this leads, so just listen to him and don't, don't go there. Any comments or questions about that? Yes, sir, Scott. Well, and also with him talking to the son, it's getting rid of what I see a lot, and that's the double standard yeah. of people wanting, you know, parents wanting to lock their daughters up in their house, you know, sure. and then telling their son to go have fun. Yeah. You know, that's I great. Mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah, that's a great point. It's not boys will be boys, but I got to protect my little girl. It, it goes, sexual purity is a, a uh, responsibility and commandment for all of God's people, of, of all people, period, but especially God's people. That's an excellent point. Um, you, there's no distinction in the sexes in, in this discussion. There are some nuances that are especially true to each one, but sexual immunity, Impurity is a temptation and a danger for both, and we need to protect both equally. No double standards. That's an excellent point. Anything else? All right, Proverbs 6 and verse 20. He speaks in some more general language, some things we have heard plenty of times already early in our study on Proverbs. My son, keep your father's command. Don't forsake the law of your mother. And then he says, bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. He talks about it as ornamentation in other places, but it's, it's, it's close. It's right there, and it's something you'll guard. It's something that you'll have. If you're a necklace wearer, that's on you everywhere you go. That's what he's saying. Take it with you. Treasure it. Value it. But then he says in verse 22, when you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. When you awake, they will speak with you. That's, what, what text does that remind you of? Does it remind you of any text? Especially thinking about a parent to a child, <clears throat> instruction. Yeah, train them up in the way they'll go. They'll not depart from it. Um, you remember a key section of scripture for the Israelites where that was an exhortation to them in the second recitation of the law? I'm leading you there. <laughs> Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And then what does he say? Right, yes, the following. So I couldn't tell where that was coming from. Exactly. He goes on to say, you got to teach this to your children. When you lie down, when you rise up, when you walk by the way, there's frontlets between your eyes and sign on your hands and your doorposts. It's everywhere. And so what that describes is the totality of your life. That's kind of what he's doing here. When, you, when you're at night, when you go to sleep, when, when you wake up, um, when you're going about in the day, at all the time you have this with you, 
and it will continue to protect you. It will continue to provide for you. And so when you're going about your daily activity and you get to this evil woman, verse 24, and her tongue is flattering and she's seducing you because you have that on your net, you're keeping it with you, you're preserving it, then you know what she's doing. You know how Satan's using her. And you can see through all the smoke and mirrors and see the ugliness that is there and avoid it. You've got to, to work at that, though. Preserve wisdom. So it says, don't lust after her beauty in your heart, verse 25. Don't let her eyelids uh, allure you with, uh, don't let her allure you with her eyelids. Uh, our, our last question, or no, our third question, kind of points to some of this. So how were we able to avoid committing sexual immorality? And that's, there's no one specific answer, but just think along the lines of what we're reading here in Proverbs. Yes, sir. Planning and, uh, and making decisions before the time that you're confronted with options, right? And so I think it was Sherry who mentioned uh, Daniel and the uh, king's delicacies and that he had purposed in his heart not to defile himself. Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? So how can I keep from sexual immorality? You nip it at the bud, as we say, from time to time. You don't say, well, it's just a look. Everybody looks. It's, it's just a movie. It doesn't really affect me. You cut it off at the source because throughout the New Testament, where does it say outward, terrible acts of sin actually begin? In your heart. In your heart. What you take in is what you're going to put out. Garbage in, garbage out, as we say. And so he says, don't last after her beauty in your heart. Don't let her lure you with your eyes. Look away. Go away. Run away. Don't go by her house. Scott. The first look can't always be avoided, but the second look can. Exactly. And I believe that's what Job is saying. Here's a covenant with my eyes. And so I, I've heard it called, you know, you're bouncing your eyes. You, okay, you, you're not going to be able to avoid some things. It's just, especially in our culture, everywhere. Not just with sexual immorality, but other things. But... Are you going to keep looking? Are you going to go back? Are you going to think about that? And so make it come with your eyes. Foster and then both. I was thinking of Romans 13, 14, where it says, make no provision. Yes. Fulfill the lust of the flesh. If, if you start down a road, you're going to end up in the wrong place. Yes, sir. Making provisions before you start. That's a great point. And, and when you think about that practically, you may ask yourself the question, before I'm taking this action, I'm making a decision right here, what am I providing for in doing this? And if the answer is not God's way, <laughs> then we probably should not do it. We should, I mean, that's wisdom too. It's not just knowing facts, but it's being able to have some foresight, look out and think about where these things lead so that I can stop it right here and not get myself in a difficult position here. Someone says, I don't know how it got to this point. That, that's, that is the song that is sung when adultery is committed. I, don't, I never intended it to happen. I don't know how I got to this point. We never intended it to go this far, but it's because you provided for it. So that's a great point. Bo? That's pretty much what I was going to say. I mean, okay. I just missed that this morning. 26 of Proverbs is actually speaking to stopping and thinking, where is this going to lead? Where, where is choosing this going to take me? Yeah, exactly.
show me what I can't see. Because, you know, I'll be the first to admit that, you know, and I think all of us could, could agree to this, that it's hard making those discernments. That's why it comes with age more times than not. It, I've lived it. I've, I've seen how these things connect, and it takes some time to sit and really think about this and a prayer to God, you know, show me what I'm not seeing here. Show me, show, put up a warning sign for me if I'm not seeing the dangers of this. And so, you know, it takes, takes effort on, on many different fronts. So he, he says, you know, talking about the, the danger of it and how terrible this is. A man is reduced to a crust of bread. She's preying on your precious life. It talks about you can't take fire to your bosom and not be burned and walk on hot coals, not be seared. And, and you're going to be guilty if you do this with a, a neighbor's wife. And then here's what's interesting because I think the, uh, one of the titles in the lesson talks about the dishonor of it. Um, yeah, immorality robs innocence and takes away honor. So here's, here's an interesting contrast. He talks about, and I won't read it, I hope you have. He talks about a contrast between one who steals and the one who commits adultery. And both are wrong. Both are sins that will condemn a soul to hell if it's not repented of and corrected. But here's the thing. He says, someone may understand why a person steals because he's starving and he's poor. And so you think of Robin Hood, you think of Aladdin. It's sin, and we're not saying that situation ethics is biblical. But one may see a person steal and think, you know what? They were trying to provide for their family, and they were wrong in doing that. But at least that means that you know, it's not like they abandon honor altogether. But they're still going to have to pay it for. They're still going to have to pay back, and they're going to they're going to have consequences. But then he says, the one who commits adultery lacks understanding and destroys his own soul. Wounds and dishonor he will get. And so there's no honor in that. There's there's nothing about that that's positive. You can give all the excuses you want. You say you cared for that person, so it just led it went too far. But there's no honor in that. There's nothing left where you can see. At least he was well-meaning. At least she was well-meaning. There's just none of that. It's, it's wrong through and through, and it will ruin your reputation, is what wisdom is telling us. It will have lasting, bitter consequences that will completely affect the rest of your life and relationships. It's just it's the way it is. It's not saying you can't recover from that and be right with God and do good things, but that destroys and so avoid it at all costs. Yes, Sherry. Also, to ask us to not consider the past. Um, past, no one has a right to check that the marriage relationship. All of us get hungry, but there's a way to, that nobody has a right to have thirsty bread. Trust in God. There's always a choice between righteousness and unrighteousness, no matter how much Satan's trying to convince us that there is no choice. And it's never right to do it the opposite way that God's will states. Jason. That's a great point, and I, and I think you, you uh, really get to the heart of, of God's wisdom in Jesus' ruling on fornication and marriage, divorce, and remarriage. It, it utterly destroys trust and that bond. Um, there's that, 
as we talked about in chapter 5, there, there's that vulnerability and trust and yielding nature in the intimacy of marriage. And you take that for just a, a moment of self-indulgence, like Jason was saying, and you use it over here, you desecrate it. You, you don't treat it as holy. And that's why that's the one thing, fornication, um, that is just cause to sever a marriage, and God will dissolve that bond. And, you know, we should not argue against that. And when an individual is a victim of that, and they can't reconcile because it just is too hard for them, we don't get to tell them, you, you should show mercy as God shows mercy. The forgiveness can be there. But Jesus says that's the one cause where trust is completely demolished, and you don't have to go back to that person. And that's why. Because of how sacred this is. Scott. There are sins that mostly affect yourself. I mean, hatred could be one of them. Uh, jealousy. But when you do this, <clears throat> you're now dragging somebody else into it. And, now, and then they've got people that's going to be affected by it. You've got others that are affected by it. And then you've caused them to sin because yeah. they're mad. They're hating on you. I mean, it just blows up. Yeah, you know? it creates a mess. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Aaron, did I see him? That's a great point. It's, it's uh, you know, to your first point, it's, a, it's the old saying, put, put yourself in their shoes. You know, we got to figure out a way to do that. Um, and that, that's the thought that comes before that will keep you from going there. And then it just, it causes a mess. It's, 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 it's a terrible thing. Um, we got to finish this on sexual immorality so we get to the other two. So just very briefly, I hope you read chapter seven, but it's basically depicting what he's already warned about. I've seen it. I looked out the window. I saw this youth who lacked understanding. He went near her house. It, it kind of implies that she's a known person. People know who she is. And he goes near her house. He doesn't, as chapter 5 says, um, remove your way far from her. I think Jason mentioned that. So she's out there. She's waiting. It talk, talks about how she's wearing an attire of a harlot. She has a crafty heart. And so it doesn't say she is a harlot. And I want us to get that. She's dressed like one. So dress matters because it reveals a crafty heart. You dress that way to get people to think about you that way. That's not chastity and that's not purity. And, and he bought it wholesale. He was allured by that. She's loud and rebellious. She's, she's out and about trying to find her victim. 
Um, it seems she may even know this man, I don't know, but she catches him and kisses him. She, she even talks about how she's paid her vows and she, she made peace offerings. And, and under the Old Testament, that's, that's one of those where the priest gets some and then you eat the rest at home. And, and she's saying, you know, I've done this good thing. I've got this good stuff. Come share it with me. What she really wants is not to share a meal. And that's what I think that's the kind of uh, saying that you hear often. It's depicted in movies and TV shows. You want to come in for coffee. It's not coffee. It's not food. But that's what she's saying. And then she ramps it up. I've readied my bed for sexual immorality. And she doesn't say it that way. She wants it to seem good. And then all these consequences that the, the, the man is warning his son about, especially concerning the vengeance of a, a husband, she says, well, he's far away. He'll never, he'll never know. And so takes away the edge of it. Her mouth is smooth as oil, is what chapter 5 says. So she caused him to yield. He went as an ox to the slaughter. It says that she has wounded and cast down many men. All who were slain by her were, were strong. Her, her, her way, house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. So, I mean, chapter 5 and, and chapter 7, put them together always. And, and read the warning and what it will lead to. And then here's an example. And... Uh, I think that's what we saw there. So chapter 6, what's the first section dealing with? What kind of uh, immorality or tricky situation have we got into? What's, what's the nature of it? What does that have to do with? Verses 1 through 5 is what I'm talking about. Surety for a friend? Yeah. A pledge, a surety for a friend. So we're talking money, right? We're talking money. It doesn't give details of like, I'm trying to help my friend out, or this is a business move and I think that I can gain from this, or I'm taking advantage of my friend. It just says, okay, you've put your, uh, yourself up as surety for your friend. You're a guarantor. You're, you know, you, you've signed the papers so that if he doesn't follow through, you've got to follow through. You've done that for him. What happens when you did that? You have shaken hands and pledged for a stranger. So you made a deal with... A stranger, an enemy. I think the Septuagint helps us understand what he's saying here. It says, my son, if you stand security for your friend, you will surrender your hand to an enemy. And the word surrender, you know, shaking hands like you're making a deal, but it uses a word for surrender in the Septuagint, which means to give up. You're giving yourself up to them. You're surrendering to them. And then it doesn't use the normal word for stranger, which we would be familiar with xenos, like as in xenophobia, uh, fear of strangers, but it uses a word for enemy. And so what you're doing in being surety for your friend is that you're putting yourself at the mercy of an evil enemy. And that's what financial imprudence does. I'm going to do this good thing for my friend, but what you don't realize is you put yourself in a really sticky situation. And similarly to sexual immorality, it doesn't just stop there. I mean, you're talking about the stress which comes from it, and you go home and you take that out on your family, and then they take it out on site. It just it causes a mess. And so be wise with your money. And he's not saying that you, you can't uh, use your money and help someone out, or, or it's not saying that you, you can't uh, take out loans and, and stuff like that. In, in Romans 13, it says, Oh, no one anything, anything except to love one another. It says, render under Caesar what is Caesar's. And so if you have debt, you do your responsibility and pay it. But you've got to think this through. This is serious stuff. And Steve, he's taught me some of this. So he's about to speak. Well, talking about teaching a lot of day classes and those things, that one point he always points out is what a strained relationship that causes between those two people as yeah. well. You've got money that you've loaned that you really couldn't just give. You're, you're willing to lose. Right. Then you're you're watching when they take a vacation. You're watching when yeah. they come, you know, with with a new car or whatever it might be. And you're causing a great. I can see the wisdom, of, you know, yeah. beyond that. It's just it's in that relationship. Definitely. And he's not saying you can't ever do that, but he's saying, listen, you know the danger of it, and you be wise about that decision. And he's talking about here a person who's already done it, and evidently it's causing problems. So he's saying, get out of it. Do everything you can to get out of it. And so it says, you're snared by the words of your mouth. You're taken by the words of your mouth. 
you know, it sounds like it was a rash decision. You spoke before you thought, you didn't think it through, and now you're in a trap. And you're at the mercy of someone you don't know or someone who it may seem had no business in this anyway, doing this anyway. They're not very responsible. That's why you need to come in and save them. But now you're the one that's in need of saving. And so he says, do this, deliver yourself. You've come into the hand of your friend. So, yes, you, you've made a deal with a, a stranger, an evil enemy, um, who, could, who could take all you have because you become pledged for your friend. But really it's up to your friend. You can talk to your friend. Go talk to your friend. Humble yourself. Plead with your friend. And he says, don't sleep. He says, go and deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a, a bird from the hand of the fowler. You do everything you can to get out of this. It may be convincing your friend to refinance. It can maybe be convincing your friend to stop being foolish with your money and pay the man that you're in debt to so that I don't have to suffer. But get out of it. Get out of it. And so what the Bible talks about with debt is ultimately don't be foolish with your money to where you're causing all of that unnecessary strain and it's actually affecting you spiritually. So money has a big deal to do with our soul in the sense of how it could damage our soul if we're not careful with it. And so financial imprudence is one of those forms of immorality. All right. That's enough about the stock market. Um, all right. Verse 6 through 11 uses what animal to warn against what vice? Here's the ant. And you can learn from the ant how not to be what? Sluggard, lazy. What does the ant do that teaches us to avoid laziness? Prepares. Prepares. Gathers food. Uh, is anyone telling the ant to do that? Is anyone on the ant to make sure he, he gets up and he does his work? He's not. So self-preservation, right? The ant cares enough about itself to put in the work and effort to provide for the future. And so, and you could pair these two together. Why is my friend in this mess? Why am I in this mess? Uh, why am I thinking I, I need to gain the, the way that I will gain financial security is through maybe amassing some interest or something through some shady deal or what? Why did I ever get to that place? Have I been working hard? Have I given myself to honest work to provide for my future where I am not tempted to do these things that are probably not going to work out for me? And so you maybe can combine them too, but go to the ant you sluggard. And he says he, he gathers, uh, she gathers her supplies in the summer and her food in the harvest. And then it says, how long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? How, so how long are you going to do this? It's like, are you kidding me? Get up and do some work. And here's what's interesting. Here's a reply. And haven't you heard this? And I, you know, as a teenager, you know, Obviously, I've, I've said something like this. A little sleep and a little somber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. It's a, let me get some rest. It's just a little bit, right? And before you know it, the day's gone by. Um, I was that guy as a teenager, sleeping till noon, waking up, and the whole day's gone, and I've not done anything. I'm eating breakfast at 1. And so it's just it's, it's a foolish game we play with each ourselves where I, I give myself a pass and I say, listen, it's self-help, self-love, self-care. I need, I need my rest. I need my sleep. In reality, that's masking laziness. And God says, get up and get to work because that's what we were created to do. Fear him and keep his commandments and provide for ourselves on earth. Scott. And there's a fine line on the other side. If you have been blessed financially, uh, I know people that have been blessed financially, and they, they go to this all the time, and they don't give anybody or yeah. hand out anything to anybody, you know, and they just act like it's because they're so, so shrewd. Right. You know, well, that's not the way to be either. No. I mean, bless others if you've been blessed. Definitely. You know, and I think that there's a, there's a real hard balance to strike sometimes, but there's a balance to strike where you're, you're not being – Stingy and selfish, you're being generous and give, giving, liberal in your giving, and, and showing love in that way. You have your goods, don't withhold it from your brother who you know is in need, but also you're not enabling. And so in Second Thessalonians 3, it says, if you don't work, 
you're not going to eat. Withdraw from those who aren't working is what it actually says. Don't give them handouts. And so there's a difference between true loving benevolence and enabling bad habits and sinful conduct. And that's, that's this wisdom. It takes wisdom. So Jason and then Bo. And then if that is your perspective, 1 Timothy 6, you will be laying up treasure in heaven by helping others with what you have. On that. Right, Bo? Uh, well, so I was talking, it reminded me of Ephesians 4 and uh, 28, where it talks about, let him who is the soul still no longer, but rather let him labor. Why? Working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Yeah. Yeah, money is a tool God's given us for what? We well, gotta take care of those who are dependent on you. And then for what? To take care of others that you can, that you find opportunity with. It's it's the Lord's money, it's you're a steward of it. So, okay, verses twelve through nineteen. I mentioned that I think that this is a, a unit, a worthless person, a wicked man, and then when he gets to verse sixteen, six things the Lord hates and seven are abomination to him. These are specific fruits of the kind of man back here in some mere image of of himself. So notice in verses 13 and 14, I think we have some parallelism. He winks with his eyes, is paralleled with perversity as in his heart. And so there's this, you know, you say something, you wink, you know, it's it's not necessarily true, or maybe it's there's something to that that you said that you didn't say explicitly. There's perversity in your heart. You're not being straightforward. He shuffles with his feet. He devises evil continually. He's always busy with his feet, making plans for evil. And then he points with his fingers, he sows discord. So they've done this, or they're this way, and there's no evidence for it, there's no reason to be saying that, you're sowing discord. So then we get down, and he's going to you know, reap what he's sowing, verse 15. Whether it's the righteous uprising and calling him on his guilt, or, or it's just you know he makes the wrong move and destroys himself, whatever it may be, it's going to catch up with him. But then notice in verse 17, you've got a proud look, lying tongue, Hand shedding innocent blood, heart devising wicked plans, feet swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. Here's what I usually do. Let's break these down into individual sins. But really what this is doing is saying, here's a person among brethren, because he's sowing discord among brethren, who is so hardened in his heart, a wicked person, a worthless person, verse 12, that he is in for himself solely, And when a person is so prideful and so self-obsessed and inflated, these are the fruits. He's got a proud look. He's proud. He's arrogant. It's all about me, isn't it? And that's the seed of all sin. And that's why a person that is so self-inflated and proud of himself, it's all about me. I'm only caring and thinking about myself, can do all of these things because he's preserving self. So he lies. Maybe he's lying about himself and his achievements. Maybe he's lying about others so that he looks better, but he's got a lying tongue. It's all in self-service. But then, hands that shed innocent blood. An individual who's so inflated with themselves is just a step and circumstance away from committing murder. The one who has hatred in his heart is the way um, Jesus put it, has already committed murder in his heart. But also, just victimizing people. And, and hurting them in other ways. He's not above that because this is the kind of person he is. And so a heart that devises wicked plans. He's not just going about and he made a bad decision and in a, in a moment of weakness he slipped up. But this is a person who is so involved with self and only wanting to preserve self that he is active in wicked planning for that self-praise and that self-service. Uh, so he's swift in running to evil. He's a false witness who speaks lies. That, that means he's, 
he's bearing witness about the character of another, about the action of another. That isn't actually true. Fabricating stories for his benefit. And then one who sows discord among the brethren. Where, why would there be an advantage of sowing discord among the brethren? Well, if it's just for me, I'm only thinking about myself. And if anyone else is among each other thinking about each other, that's a threat to myself. And so I'm going to divide and conquer. And now I come out victorious. That's, that's where sin leads us, to a heart that is so hardened, that's how it acts. Completely opposite of who Christ is, and certainly opposite of who he calls us to be. Um, thank you for your time and attention.